Psalm 83. Psalm 83. I'm going to read the whole psalm. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lift up thy head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee, the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites, of Moab and the Hagarenes, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. Aser also is joined with them. They have holpen the children of Lot, Selah. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook of Kaisan which perished at Endor, they became as dung for the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all their princes as Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, Let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. O oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the, as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth the wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire. So persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the Most High over all the earth. Dung for the earth. Dung for the earth is what we're talking about today. Psalm chapter 83 begins with this cry to God. Keep not thou silence. Keep not thou silence, O God. We live in a time when the people of God are being told, are being charged, are being implored, are being commanded, even with mocking and ridicule and threatenings, to keep silence, to shut your mouths, to stop speaking. We don't want to hear you. The people of God are constantly being told to keep themselves quiet, to keep their mouths shut, quit speaking the truth. And yet at this time, more than ever, our prayer needs to be, keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace and be not still, O God. The reality is, is that the world wants us silent. The world wants us to shut it. The world wants us to stop speaking the truths of the Lord and His Word. And in many ways, the world that we live in is able to silence us. If we really think about it, we can be cast into prison. We can be, um, we can be removed from the social media. We can be uh, put away from the public events. We can even have our tongues removed, which we have seen happen to Christians in time past. The, the very real and present reality is, is that the Christian can be silenced. But the Lord will never be silenced. Amen. And so our prayer from the heart of wanting and desiring the truth to go forward in this world and in this life needs to be, keep not thou silence, O God. Amen. It's time for thee to speak. The world wants us silent and can silence us. But the Lord will not be silenced. Isaiah chapter 55. You can keep your finger there in Psalm 83. I will be there again. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 10. The Bible reads, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So even as the rain goes forth and does exactly what it was intended to, giving bread to the eater, giving seed to the fowl, giving whatsoever the earth desires as it moveth forth in its paths, so shall the word of God go forth from his mouth and shall do exactly what God accomplished. If God, ac if God desires that his word be heard, his word will be heard. If God desires that his word 
destroys, it will destroy. If God desires that his world, where word would break down and shatter, then exactly what his word will do. His settled in heaven word, his from this day forever word, his pure word, his fire word, his hammer for a word of God will not be silenced. And the more that we pray unto God to make it heard, the more he will be emboldened to do so. Our prayer will not fall on deaf ears when we say, God, let your voice be heard. God, proclaim the truth in this ungodly and wicked nation. God, tell them what they need to hear at this time. God, keep not thou silent. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35, in Hebrews 10 and verse 35, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35, talks about our perspective in regard to waiting on the word of the Lord to go forth. Because we're in a time when God isn't thundering from the heavens. We don't see that. We don't see God coming in the clouds and showing himself strong to those that wait for him. We don't see the word of the Lord going forth in the ultimate power that it will one day and we all hope for and wait for. And so we are currently stuck in this opportunity, in this moment of time where we can just embolden and enable and encourage the word of the Lord by praying that the word of the Lord would go forth as it was sent. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35 says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Be confident in this. Don't cast that away. Amen. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in them. But we are not of them who drop back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Don't cast that confidence away. And what is our confidence? Our confidence is that we've believed on Christ. We believed in God. We're trusting God. And we're not drawing back from that. We're standing firm. We're standing, establishing the truth that God will recompense His own. And we need to live by that faith and not draw back, not be soft, not be wavering as if we're blown in the wind, but trust the Lord. And in that confidence, receive that great recompense of your reward. But God has given us this opportunity that we might grow in one area. And what is that one area? Verse 36, you have need of patience, that after that you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. If we just get, get, get promises all the time, we're never going to grow in patience. And what a great virtue it is to have patience, especially before the living God. We're going to go through some things. When you're reading the book of Revelations, you see all sorts of things that believers go through, that they suffer for. History has explained to us all that Christians and believers have gone through throughout the ages. They needed patience to endure such things. So, such great trials of afflictions, such great sufferings that even are explained in the very next chapter when he starts to en envelop and starts to pour out. The reality is that we know of Abraham, we know of Jacob, we know of Joseph, but countless people throughout histories have quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edges of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, wept valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection, and others had trial of cruel markings and scourging, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sun asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world is not worthy. And this same world that is unworthy of us is the same world we cry out to God to judge. And that same world that was not worthy of us is the same world that we constantly and consistently live in where we grow and we mature and we are strengthened in the area of patience. Because right now I'm not sure that I could go through such things. But if I am to grow in faith and to not draw back, if I'm to live by faith and to not draw back, if I'm to believe on Christ unto the saving of the soul, even in great trials of afflictions, I need to grow in patience and that's where we're at right now. Calling out to God that his settled in heaven from this day forever, pure fire, hammer of a word of God, would not be signs, would go forward in our stead. 
Because today, we are being silenced as Christians. So today, our opportunity is that we be patient and that we, be, that we would pray through these opportunities. Even as David is doing in this passage of Scripture, Psalm chapter 83. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, nor be still, O God. Verse 2 says, Lo, thine enemies make a tumult. There's an uproar. There's a loud and confused noise coming from the enemies of the Lord. They are gathering together. They are chanting. They are emboldening one another. It's like a riot, a tumult is. It's constantly just twirling, twirling, twirling in and much. It's building up power, building up strength like a hurricane, a tumult, a twisting. And it's built upon a confused noise. It says here, and they that hate thee have lifted up thy head. Imagine being so confident, so confused, so puffed up and arrogant that your head would be lift up in pride. Your head would be lift up in arrogancy. Your head would be lift up as you if you were the greatest of all. But the Bible is recording that they are ignorant because the tumult is one of confusion. They are constantly turning about filled with their own arrogancy and yet... They are just nothing more than confident, confused, ignoramuses. Head up, chest out, thinking that they're better than everybody else. Thinking that they are the greatest thing since sliced bread. The world thinks that it is fantastic that it is placed so. That we have lifted ourselves up. We have built ourselves up. We have made the modern day Tower of Babel. And hear us cry. Hear our pride. Hear us marching up and down these streets. And they're coming for us. They're coming after God's own people with this same attitude. Verse 3. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. What you see on the streets, don't get me, don't, don't misunderstand. That's, that's been planned. That's been plotted. There's been crafty counsel made. There's been streets picked. There's been routes marked. There's been areas designated that this is where we're going to show our pride. This is where we're going to show how great we are. This is where we're going to march flagrantly and in everyone's face about how, how wonderful we think we are. They have taken crafty counsel against who? Thy people. Whose people? God's people. And consulted against thy hidden ones. And make no mistake, the agendas are the same. The counsel is against the anointed of God. The counsel is against the people of God. It's also against the hidden ones. And what do we see more and more and more and more and more every day? We see the proud homos mocking the institution of God. We see the proud homos mocking the family unit, marching with their arrogancy before all, trying to show it off, trying to destroy the family, taking crafty counsel about how they would be able to, and at the same time, in that same motivation, walking side by side, the crafty counsel is also against the hidden ones. Well, who's the hidden ones of the Lord? The ones in the safest spot ever, within a woman's womb, within the confines of a mother's womb. To the tune of millions. This isn't just a, a small percentage. This is millions of babies that are being boarded every day, every year. We see it time and time again. The number one death this year was this. And so it's plain to see that the, the desire to rip apart the family and to promote the filth, the desire to rip apart the child and promote childlessness as if it was freedom, is one and the same. Crafty counsel against the people and against also the hidden ones of God. Verse 4 says, They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, and the name of, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Thy people here, the saved, the believers, the hidden ones, the aborted, the hidden, those ones that are found in the secret place. They're taking crafty counsel against them, and their desire, what they are saying in mockery towards the living God is this. They're saying, come and let us. Come and let us. And what is their desire? That they would first cut them off from being a nation, and second, that the name of Israel may be held no more in remembrance. And indeed, this was a bold statement to be made even at the time of Psalm 83, that Israel would no longer be a nation, that they would be cut off from being a nation. But we know that this was accomplished, at least in part, in 100 AD, when the Roman emperor came in and swept Jerusalem out, dispersed all of the Jews, all of the Israelites, so that there was no more a nation. Now, we saw that play out 
But today we have kind of the opposite way of which they'll do something. God will, uh, Satan will do one of two things. He'll either try to destroy something or he'll try to subvert and ruin something from within. And we see this all the time. So he first tried to destroy Israel, wipe it off the map. But a fraudulent Israel rose up. The name of Israel rose up. And at least in a figure type was here and was present and was able to at least have that name in remembrance. But his desire was twofold. He would destroy them and they would cease to be a name that would be held in remembrance. So what did he do with that fraudulent name of Israel, that fraudulent nation of Israel? He caused it to be tarnished. He caused the reputation of that nation to be dragged through the mud. And now what is called Israel today is full of sodomy and filth. It's full of a wicked religion. It's full of greedy lenders. And for those that know the truth, we know it's filled with murderers and thieves. Those that have stepped into someone else's nation and ripped it from them. Those that have taken the Palestinians and removed them from what was rightly yours. Hey, if you're living in a place that's yours, I don't care if you got a deed that goes all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Bible records that had they done what was promised, had they done what was agreed upon between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Lord at that time, they would still be in that land and the Palestinians would have never settled in there. But instead of getting right with God, the fraudulent nation of Israel came in by force and removed them. That's not a godly nation. That's not something that should be lifted up as, as, as if it were something godly and relevant to the scriptures. No. Read through Deuteronomy and see how many times the land promise is associated with this wonderful two-letter word, if. If thou will, I will. If thou will, I will. If thou will, I will. And you know what happened more often than not? They didn't, so God won't. And God didn't. He did not give them back that nation. He did not return that land unto them. Why? Because they've never done what he said. And what he said was to obey. And what he said to obey in was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. And thy house. Amen. And they rejected that. They just they decided not to. So now what we have is twofold. We have that, yes, Israel as a nation was cut off and removed. Now the name, though held in remembrance, is dragged through the mud, which I want nothing to do with it in the carnal sense. I want nothing to do with that nation over there in the Middle East. I don't want to stand with that filth. I don't want to support that garbage. It was built upon the blood of innocent people. It was built upon a framework dictated by evil men and seducers at the highest echelons of this society. I want nothing to do with Israel according to the flesh. So the devil has achieved for a time what he asked for here, what his crafty counselors have desired, what his puffed up, tumultuous, confused, bold and proud ignoramuses have wanted, useful idiots, was that they would destroy Israel for being a nation, the name of it being cut off and not brought anymore into remembrance in the former, how it should be brought in into remembrance. But there's one thing that he forgot, that Though the soil over there has been corrupted and is full of blood and wickedness and is tarnished and is disgusting and that is filthy, he forgot, Satan forgot that Israel which is above is free. And that's the mother of us all. He forgot that, that we are the chosen generation. We are the royal priesthood. We are the holy nation, the peculiar people unto God. And that can never be touched. That can never be removed. That can never be destroyed. That's just one of those great promises that is settled forever in heaven. Israel will always be held into remembrance no matter what you do to it here upon this earth. Verse 5 says, For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. And so just like we saw in Psalm 2, the whole world united in confederacy against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Let us not have to hear the word. Let us not have to see the word. Let's, not, let's cast away the Lord from our remembrance. Even so, it plays out here in this passage of scriptures. 
There will be one government. We've seen it. There will be one monetary system. We've seen it. We can see the foundations of these things coming to be. Where paper money no longer exists or has value in the same way. We see governments more and more shaking hands and agreeing on things where they never would before. And those two aspects of the Antichrist beast system make sense. But what about this one, the third tier, which is one world religion? I mean, ten years ago you wouldn't even fathom this. That, that, that you know, Jews and, Israel, uh, and, and Islam would shake hands, that Catholics would be getting along with, with everybody, that all these religions are gradually blurring their lines and becoming one. That's why I keep preaching people at the door. There's only two religions. You've got to pick which one you want to be a part of. Either you're a Bible-believing Christian saved by the blood of the crucified one and born again by the Spirit of God, or you're every other one. There's only two. You've got to pick, right? You've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or just fall into the mush of it all. And do you know who else falls into that mush? Atheists. How about this? Pan, pantheists. How about agnostics? How about all of the, I have these varying different degrees of what I believe about God. Basically just setting up God in their own image. But I witnessed it this week, and actually our church found its place on a list of people that need to be blackballed, that need to have their, 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 their social media taken out, that have to be... We found our church on this big long list, and it was atheists agreeing with pantheists, agreeing with agnostics, all coming together under one banner that is intolerant of intolerance. <laughs> Completely intolerant of intolerance. Trying to silence any opposing and biblical view. They have united to destroy us, and they think that it's, they're going to do it you know, by, by banishing our, our uh, what's that thing? <clears throat> our means of getting money or whatever, the PayPal. <clears throat> they think they're going to take away our PayPal. It's not even hooked up to anything. I got an account, that's it. <laughs> We're not going to be destroyed if you take away our ways of getting money from online. They think, though, that whatever we're running here is some sort of billion-dollar conglomerate. It's insanity. We have, we have the Bible, and we have some ratty suits, and we got men and women that love souls and want to see them saved. We don't have much here, do we? we we've got a rented space. We've got, we've got old hymn books. Right? We, we've got wonderful snacks. That's probably one of the best things that we get week to week, right? The provision of snacks. We don't have a lot here. They think they're going to destroy us by taking away an opportunity to receive money online. It's, it's foolishness because we are crying day and night, keep not thou silence, O Lord. Silence us. Hey, you fagnostics Gnostics, and Gathias, get together. Enjoy your company. Have a united front where you just want to fight against us. I could care less. All you're doing is proving the Bible to be true. Amen. Where I wouldn't believe it before, now I'm seeing a bunch of people that have varying worldviews that would never get along in a debate, would never see eye to eye, are united on one front that they hate Christians. If we just have a common enemy, then who gives a rip about the rest? And that's what they're doing. They are uniting under the banner of tolerance, and they're completely intolerant of our ideals. Verse 6 begins to highlight how this played out in David's day. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines and the heavens of Tyre, Acer also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot. So here we see Edom with Ishmael. We see Moab with the Hagarites. And what, is, what do these groups have in common? These groups are the rejects of the story of the Bible. These are the groups, and if you read Edom and Ishmael, they, they walked alongside great men of God, but ultimately chose to stand with the world instead of standing with the men of God. Moab and Hagarites offshoots of a righteous line that eventually brought Christ. And yet, instead of walking with the men of God and sticking with the lineage, the plan, the plot, the storyline that God had, you know, thousands of years away for them upon that cross and in the end would bring them unto glory, right? The, the true vine, the true line of believers, and they rejected it. These groups are the rejects. They are the would-be's. They are the backsliders. They are the ones that had the closest and had the best opportunity to be on the straight and narrow, and yet they rejected it. These are the ones that were family. They were friends. They were, they were laborers one with another. And ultimately, they went and chose a different path. This is like the Hebrews chapter 6 group. And if you would, you can go to 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2. The Hebrews chapter 6 group 
were the ones that were once enlightened. <clears throat> They're the ones that have tasted of the heavenly gift. That fell away. In other words, they had every opportunity to receive it. They heard the truth. They knew the truth. They walked with the truth. They, they, they had understanding of the truth. And yet, ultimately, they fell away from the truth. This is the people that hear the gospel. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. Hear the gospel. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. Hear the gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah I believe it. Uh, not for me right now. Nah, no thanks. Nah, I'm going to do my own thing. And eventually, the floodgates open, the door shuts, and that's it for them. God has a time, a window of opportunity whereby he extends grace unto people. And if they want to close that door, that's completely their responsibility. That's completely their prerogative. But when that door closes, there is no turning back. Those that were once enlightened who have fallen away, it is impossible, the Bible says, to return them again unto repentance. For them to return again unto that place of repentance. We saw it with Judas. We saw it with Esau, where they returned with repentance in tears, and yet it was not given them. Esau not receiving of the promise that he originally had, and Judas not receiving the salvation of his soul. Because that window had closed, they were once enlightened, and so these ones that have risen up against the people of God, against the secret people of God, have now crossed the line to where they are working together as rejects, would-be's, backsliders against the Lord and against His anointed. Second Peter chapter two, and verse seventeen said, "These are wells without water; clouds they are carried away with a tempest, to whom the mist." of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. For if after that they had escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So here we see that through the pollutions of this world, through the lusts of this world, through the wantonness of their own souls, they had the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then rather than embracing it and receiving him, they were entangled again, overcome, and the latter end of them is worse than it was in the beginning. Verse 21, for it had better, it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after that they had known it to turn from the holy commandment which was delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to wallowing in the mire. This passage of scripture is highlighting what we're talking about in reference to Edom, in reference to Ishmael, in reference to Moab, the Hagarites, those that had tasted of the heavenly gift, those that had knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in their own context. Those that knew the way of righteousness and then after they had known it, turned from the commandment, went unto the weak and beggarly elements, and according to the true, the true proverb, returned unto the vomit that they had dropped before. It was better for this group that they had not known. This proverb then becomes true. We can pause and we can reflect upon such a scripture as this. Back in Psalm chapter 83, the Bible continues and talks about them again. Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines, with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also is joined with them. They have Hulpen, the children of Lot, Selah. And here's that pause. Here's that meditation. Here's something to think about. If you come across the Selah in Proverbs, especially if it's associated with a great big name or it's associated with a very dynamic uh, Bible scripture being presented to you, Selah. I do exactly what it says. Pause, meditate, think upon these things. If you go back and you study the history of some of these nations and how they engage themselves with the people of God, with the nation of Israel. You'll, you'll begin to explain, you begin to understand more and more about this exact psalm. Here it says that they had hope in the children of Lot. And we need to ask ourselves, who were the children of Lot? Back in the story of Genesis 19, 
The children of Lot were broke up into two categories, and I have applied them to the modern uh, picture that we have now. They're one of two things. The children of Lot were either lame, liberal Christians at best, or they were sodomites, which is at worst and most likely. <clears throat> we saw the sisters who had made Lot drunk and caused to fornicate with him that they would conceive child and then bring forth because they had such a mixed up idea of what the end times were. They thought they were the last human beings that existed upon earth, if you read the dialogue there. And so out of preserving the very fabric of human society, they did this disgusting thing. They were lame Christians. They had no understanding of the word of God. They had no understanding of how God acts upon nations such as Sodom and how they were just a remnant, yes, but there was 7,000 more that had not bowed the need to Baal. They had found themselves in a position <clears throat> where out of fear and under misunderstanding, they revealed that they were just lame, liberal Christians at best, had no understanding of the scripture, and succumbed to it. Who else are the children of Lot that these groups, that these nations of heathen have holpen together with, have worked together with? <clears throat> the lame, liberal Christians at best, they're sodomites at worst, and most likely. We know of the other daughters who went with their scoffing husbands, who stayed with their husbands in Sodom and, 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 and chose to ride out what was happening, what was coming onto them for unbelief, right? Lot, you've never preached this before. You've never said such things before. Lot, Lot, Lot you're a fool, right? And they, they chose to sit, put, remain as Sodomites. Like I said, <clears throat> the children were lame liberal Christians at best, Sodomites at worst. They were just like the nations around them. <clears throat> Verse 9 says, Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook of Kison, which perished at Endor. They became as dung for the earth. So here, the prayer is the same and continues. Do unto them as unto the Midianites. Grabbing hold of verse 1 that says, Keep not thou silence, O God, nor your words, make thy name known. And we pray this indeed, yes, for the enemies. <clears throat> but at this time, I also would say that prayer encompasses those that are friends with the enemies. Because today we have this very real problem. We have these Baptists who refuse to preach Leviticus 20.13. You know, I sent that out to about 300 people. I said, hey, you going to approach this? Are you going to preach this scripture? Are you going to touch on this topic during Gay Pride Month, so-called? When was it a month? I mean, I used to suffer through like a week. Oh, it was Pride Week. And I worked in downtown Toronto, and I always have to like go through that week. And then suddenly it's a month. Yeah. Unbelievable. <clears throat> but I... Uh, they're getting emboldened, they're getting stronger in this, and so yes, we pray that God would not keep silence, would destroy the enemies, but what about those that are yoked up with them? What about those that are hoping of them? The children of Lot, who are lame liberal Christians at best, or sodomites at worst. What about these Baptists? Like I said, I sent it out to 300, I think 150 of them still existed, I got like 20 responses, and it all was, yeah brother, it's abomination, yeah, I'm, 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 uh, you know, I'm ministering to my people here. Yeah, I want nothing to do with Pastor Anderson. Yeah, yeah. And I said, this has nothing to do with him. Just because it's a sound clip that puts forth the challenge, my challenge to you is not to stand behind your pulpit in your little church and say, it's a sin. Sodomy's still a sin. Sodomy's a sin. Yep, that's right. Bless God, sodomy's a sin. I'm asking you to thunder from the rooftop what Leviticus 20, 13 actually says. Yes, it says it's an abomination, but it says they shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. It says stone them with stones. The context of that continues and insinuates, no, it commands the death penalty to sodomy and other great sins. And yet they refuse. And so they are yoking themselves up with all of these heathen nations that are coming against God through it. What about the Christians who are saying, oh, love thy neighbor? What about the Christians who grab that as like a catch? phrase, a catch-all for every situation. Just love everybody. I heard this too from these preachers. Love the neighbor. That's, that's what I'm going to endeavor to do. I'm going to strive to love my neighbor. Well, you can't love your neighbor while you're letting somebody attack them physically. You can't love somebody and let some pervert grow on them. You can't. Those are mutually exclusive ideas. What about 
you know, all sin is the same. What about love the sin or hate the sin? All these, all these slogans that they just come, keep coming back at me with. We're not talking the same thing. We're dealing with different contexts. I am 100% for love, 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 my neighbor. Love, love, love for my brother. All of these aspects of Jesus' ministry, but what they keep forgetting, what they charge me, you need to go back to Jesus' life, and you need to learn how he wants you to minister and love people, is what these guys said to me. And I said, that is a great idea. And you know what? As soon as I'm done the sermon series I'm in, I'm going to the book of Revelation to find out how Jesus Christ interacts with this world. I'm going to the book of Revelation to find out how Jesus wants me to act in this world through the best example that I could follow, and that's the example of Christ himself. It's garbage, and they're yoking themselves up unbeknownst to them with the wicked ones that are attacking godly Bible-believing Christians. They never would have thought they'd be doing this by being silent, by, by taking the soft stance, by taking the love thy neighbor. They're arm in arm with the queers that are marching in the street. Why? Because they're both pulling in the same direction, and that's opposite the will of God. They're both pulling towards wickedness. They're both pulling in the same direction, which, what does it do? It's crafty counsel against the people and the hidden ones. That's what they're encouraging. That's what they're enforcing. And all the others are just fence sitters. No response. No reply. No, nothing to say. We're just going to sit on the fence. What, wait how this plays out? I don't even know. When you're too, uh, refusing to take sides, you've taken a side. How often do we say that to people when we're at the door? By, by saying you're just not going to decide, you've chosen hell. You, you can't sit on the fence when it comes to salvation. You can't sit on the fence when it comes to the will of God. You either believe him or you don't. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. And if you just want to sit in the middle of this battle that we're facing in this world, you're always pulling towards the wicked. Do, Lord, unto them, even as thou did unto the Midianites. The Bible records as Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook of Kaisan, which perished at Endor, they became as dung for the earth. So I don't know if you know the history of the Midianites. God commanded Israel to vex and to smite them in Numbers chapter 25 and verse 7. In Numbers 31, verse 2 through 7, guess what happens? They were vexed and they were smitten. The Midianites destroyed. Of Sisera, who is the leader of that army, he crawled away from the great battle and he found himself refuge. He found himself relief within the tent of one jail. And when Jael found him, she brought him in. He said, give me water. And she was wise. And she said, no, here's some milk. And that warm milk lulled him to sleep. And Sisera laid his head down on her lap. And that wise woman took a spike, pressed it to his temple, and drove it. Do unto them as you have done unto the Midianites, Lord, and as unto Sisera. He came to Jael seeking refuge, was lulled to sleep, and was destroyed. He came unto God's people seeking refuge, was lulled to sleep, and destroyed. Of Jabin and his army, Israel prospered over them until all of them have been destroyed, the Bible records. They prospered. They continued to press down and press down and press down until they ended. These all perished and became as dung for the earth, the Bible here records. And today I pray this same prayer to those haters of God. Today I pray that God would speak, would not hold his silence, that he would take and by his all-powerful hands would mold situations in our life and situations in our nation and situations that we see all around us to the end that the enemies of God who are counseling against us. The enemies of God who are counseling against the babies in the womb would be destroyed. That they would be vexed and smitten. That they would have a vengeance poured out upon them. That there would be a stake driven through their temple and they would be destroyed. And God's people would prosper over them until all have been destroyed. We see this as an example. We see this as a type. We see this as how God would have his own vengeance enacted upon them. Keep not thou silence. Our action is to prayer. Our action is to call out to God to act. We say, do unto them as you, as you have done in previous times unto the Midianites and to these other groups. We call out to God and we plea unto him. 
But not only the haters of God, what about the sympathizers? What about those that are yoked up with them? Those that are confederate with them? Those that are hoping with them? Do not I hate them, O Lord? I'm not I grieved with them? Go to Psalm 39, 139. Psalm 139. I'm going to avoid quoting it so I don't mess it up. Just so we can all see this. Because some people will say, oh, you have to love your neighbor. You have to love those that essentially hate the Lord. But David here, under the inspiration of the Holy God, reveals that this is not the case. Psalm 139. We'll begin in verse 21. It says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Valid question. And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? Remember, the, the ministry of those that are attacking is always against the Lord. We just happen to be the only physical manifestation of God that they have upon this earth, the Holy Spirit living in us. Verse 22, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. And I love those two verses. They're fantastic verses. But a lot of people will just say, oh, you know, that's just David. He's in he's an emotional situation, and he's been hurt, and he's just saying what's on his mind and on his heart. Okay, you might be able to agree with that and even, you know, uh, sympathize with that. Whenever you've been angry, whenever you've been upset, whenever you've been feeling intense hate towards somebody that hates God. But look at this in verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And that's a heart that is seeking after God. That's a heart that's open before God saying, God, if this hate is wrong, search it. If this hate is wrong, try it. If this hate is wrong, lead me to what is right. This scripture reveals that David had the heart that was seeking after God, the same heart that God promised was in him when he said he's a man after mine own heart and recorded that in scriptures. He retained that same heart even when he was saying something like, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies, those that hate you, O Lord. But shouldn't we love everybody? Shouldn't we just blanket, catch all, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin, love, 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 extend it to everyone? Second Chronicles chapter 19. You can try it. 2 Chronicles chapter 19. In verse 2 says, And Jehu the son of Hanani the seer went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Another really good question. And here the prophet, here the preacher, here inspired by the word of God, recorded and preserved in 2 Chronicles, speaks the response to that question, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? Shouldest thou love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is the wrath of, upon thee from the Lord, from before the Lord. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Literally, if you're loving somebody that hates God, you have God's wrath upon you. We shouldn't love, love, love everybody. And here we live in a nation where everybody seems to have that mentality. Like I said, the, the, the Sodomites are crying, love, 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 love. And then in the Baptist churches, they're all like, love, 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 love. And it's making me sick. Because who's going who's gonna to speak the truth anymore? <clears throat> Just this week, there's this guy named David Lynn. He's, he's a street preacher in downtown Toronto, okay? And I don't agree with street preaching. Okay, more often than not, and I tried to kind of see this guy's doctrine, you don't see it a lot, but on his website there's all these kind of miracle healings and all this stuff typical to a Pentecostal movement. And generally when someone's preaching in the streets, it's a repent of your sins gospel, right? They're usually crying, repent, 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 like just, just as a general term. Another thing that makes me believe he's probably wrong in this is that he was out preaching to the homos. He was out preaching in front of like the first day of Pride, I guess he didn't even know about it, he claims. So this guy was scooped up and taken away to jail after a long series of events. And you can catch it all on YouTube. But basically, he's out there preaching. And it's a soft message. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a love, love, love message. It's an acceptance message, right? And I'm watching this guy, and he's really not doing anything wrong. He's got a megaphone, and he's blowharding, and he's, he's doing that. But it's a very, very open and accepting message. I think he said open and acceptance many times. But through the course of this thing, you see just more and more and more of these sodomites just getting inflamed and just getting angry and just storming and swarming and getting all around him. He starts saying, stop assaulting me. Don't touch me. Why are you tripping me? I'm just trying to preach here, right? We're, we're in Canada. 
I don't, yeah. There's nothing wrong with preaching in the streets. There's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, I believe this, this is what I believe, you're wrong, I'm right. There's even interviews of him talking to police before he did it, like, if I was to say this and this and this, they're like, oh, no, there'd be nothing wrong with that. And next thing you know, he's being hauled away to prison. And he's saying, aren't you going to deal with the assault? Aren't you going to deal with what they were saying? Aren't you going to deal with it? No, he was taken away for insulting or assault or creating this right. Anyways, like I said, I don't know his doctrine. He's probably repent of your sins. <clears throat> Generally, when somebody goes to the LGBTQ, XYZ, ABC, LMNOP group, it's always a repent of your sins gospel because I've seen all of these, you know, I was a homo and then I got saved. And it's usually associated with some sort of repent of your sins. Well, I stopped doing that and then that's how I knew I was saved. And it, never, it never is a legitimate salvation. I've never seen a legitimate conversion from being uh, a sodomite to being saved. All I have to say this, turn to Matthew chapter 7. So this guy goes out, and like I said, they're just completely against him. They're, they're rallying, they're screaming in his face, they're just being vicious towards him. And this all made, made you know, mainstream news. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 7, and this is the main thing that I, I find wrong with him. I mean, one thing that I found was that he was saying, his message is this, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? He gave his only begotten son. It says that for a reason, right? He kept saying this, he gave his one and only son, he gave his one and only son, he gave his one and only son. No, ain't wrong, only begotten son. There's a difference because I'm a son of God and you're a son of God and you're a son of God and you're a son of God, right? There's many sons of God, okay, right? It's those that have believed upon him. But he's going out with this message and it's, one of John 3.16 and his own interpretation of it. But he's giving it to the wrong group. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6 says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. And this guy experienced that. He's out there and he's trying to give this love, 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 this, 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 his version of the gospel message into a group that will not receive it. He is trying to cast spiritual pearls before swine. He's trying to give that which is holy unto the dogs. And then before you know it, Officer Dyke, and I can't make this up, his name was D-Y-K, shows up and he's like, hello, how are you doing today? Like, you can't be preaching here like this. And he just sounded so effeminate. And this guy comes up to him, and he was the main initiator. It's not the manly cop, but this one grabs him, hauls him away, throws him into prison, and does not address any of the sins of his own, any of the sins of the people that are causing the riot, any of the sins that are causing the contention. The man was just there to preach. I only bring that up to highlight the fact that we need to understand today that this war is real. And today, the problem is not only the wicked ones that are against us, but those that would grab and be confederate with them. This preacher, David Lynn, learned a hard lesson. He needed to learn this, and I pray that he does learn it. And that him going out there and standing at the corner of, of church and rainbow is not going to do anything. You are casting your pearls before swine. You are simply adding fuel to the fire. You're simply doing the opposite of what would any person with any kind of sanity scripturally and spiritually would do. Learn that lesson. Instead of going out and treating them as if they can be redeemed, he should be going out and treating them as they will become. And that is dung of the earth. We can't be going around and loving everybody. We need to understand that God has rendered some to be dung of the earth, and that is the end of them. Keep not thou silence, O God. Speak the truth now. These nations are rallying against us. These peoples are rallying against us. Even ones that seemeth to be of us are now yoking up with them. The children of Lot have been hoping together with them. And now more than ever, we need to stand on the truth. We need to stand on God's word and not be sucked up into that prevailing spirit that is all going the same direction, which is in opposition to the truth of God. So my prayer remains in that same spirit of Gideon. If you look at verse 11, it says, Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all their princes as Ziba and Zalmona, who said, Let us take to themselves the houses of God in possession. If you know anything about the nobles of Oreb and Zeb, they were slown upon a rock. If you know anything about the princes of Ziba and Zalmona, they were taken captive and eventually stricken to the ground by the same men of God, Gideon. 
And this righteous leader, Gideon, is the one that would to God would rise up in our nation. We would have a very prevalent, real, tangible voice in opposition of the filth that is coming at us. But the reality is, is what, what is being presented here, we may just have to keep on praying. We won't have that leader rise up who's going to enforce these laws and is going to lead righteously and justly this nation to issue the death penalty where it's due. We won't have that leader like Gideon who's going to come in and take out all of the wicked leaders and cut them off and destroy them. We're not going to have that leader stand up here. Instead, we're going to have to have God do it for us. We're going to have to pray to him. Keep not thou silence, O God. Make them as Sisera, O God. Do unto them as you did unto the Midianites, O God. Or else we're going to suffer what they want from us. Who said, let us take to ourselves houses of God in our possession. And what's happening is that most are giving in to this pressure. Especially this month. With their refusal to preach. With their refusal to stand. With their refusal to have a voice in this time. We've got all sorts of preachers who behind scenes and in an email will tell me, yup, I stand upon that, but you're not going to see it publicly. Out fully say, rightfully saying that. They're like, I'm, I'm never going to show that kind of stuff publicly. I'm not going to preach that. I'm not going to get involved in this kind of uh, battle, in this kind of war. I'm called to minister into this little church. But that's not going to do anything, and that is actually part of the problem. The house of God is becoming the possession of the filthy ones. Why? Because if we remain silent, they've won. If we're not going to speak up, they've won. If we're not going to voice the truth, we've won. And so many are giving in. Many are choosing to remain silent. Many of these preachers, in fact, are just opening the doors when you have... You have people doing this born this way ministry. Bob Gray Sr. stands up and, and he endorses this Johnny Nixon book and says, you know, sodomites make really good children's workers and all these kinds of things. And the house of God is being turned from the house of God into a den of iniquity. And this is happening without them even knowing it. They go on day after day, week after week, month after month, and they feel like, they act like, they sing like, they preach like. They're still the same independent, fundamental, King James only Bible believing Baptist church that they've always been. But they're not realizing that they are being subverted. How are they being subverted? Opening the doors that they would be children's workers. That's the worst case. But how about this? Just not voicing against it. Not preaching against it. Not letting your voice be heard during pride month, whereby you would condemn it, whereby you would speak against it, whereby you'd lift up your voice as a trumpet, even just to say, God, destroy all that wickedness going on in that march, in that parade. God, destroy them. They hate thee, Lord. I hate them too. God, with a perfect hatred, I hate them. Would you, God, not hold your peace? Could we see you, Lord, and act your vengeance upon them? But no one's willing to do that kind of thing. No one's willing to even ask God to do it for them. We need to be thundering this kind of preaching from the pulpits in Canada. We need to be voicing the truths of the scriptures. Leviticus 23, 13 challenge was perfect. Just present it in the context. Just give me what that Bible verse actually means to me today as a Christian in Canada. But they would not do it. Why? Because they think it's going to come against them and they've actually been disarmed as a house of God. They're a den of iniquity and nothing more. Verse 13 says, oh my God, make them like the wheel as the stubble before the wind. Wouldn't this be great? Let's just pray this. Oh my God, make them like a wheel as the stubble before the wind. As the fire burneth the wood and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, so persecute them with thy tempest and make them afraid of thy storm. Would to God he would take his fiery vengeance and would act it upon those that would lift up their heads with pride, would lift up their faces, would embolden themselves and come at God's people because they deem them intolerant. But here also we have the sympathizers. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name, O Lord. I believe there's a break there where, where the, the psalmist is praying that that. God would enact his vengeance upon the wicked, upon the evildoers, upon the haters of God, that others would see it, would be filled with shame, right? Because the Sodomites have no shame, right? Verse 16, fill their face with shame that they may seek thy name. Would to God people would wake up when they saw the judgment of the wicked. Would to God they would wake up when they realized 
that the swords are turned against them, that they're drawn, that their enemy is close, the tumult is there and is ready to destroy. Would to God they would wake up, be filled with shame and would seek their name and not puff themselves up with pride. Let the wicked, verse 17, let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. That men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. God promised those who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In verse 17 he says, let them be put to shame and perish. Would to God that those that have believed on Christ and trusted on Christ wouldn't suffer something so harsh as perishing upon this earth. Not losing their eternity, but losing any kind of remnant of, of shamelessness. Are we saved today? Well, quit budding around with the dung of this earth. This is the problem. We buddy around with those that are set to be the dung of this earth. We buddy around with those that are going to become as the dung of this earth. And when you're playing around with dung, even the vicinity of dung, why do we then act surprised when we get some on us? Why do we then act confused when some gets on us? And then why do we act so shocked when the judgment of God rolls in and he's looking for dung and he's cleaning up dung and he finds a Christian and moves him along too. Because why? Because he's been say, hanging with them. He's been endorsing them. He's been not fighting against them. He's been as one of them, but not standing and not making a clear position, not making a clear stance. When you walk with dung, when you act like dung, don't be surprised when God judges you as dung. For shame if you were. For shame if we are. Verse 18, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. God is not slack, folks, concerning his promise. He will come. He will judge. Our responsibility now is to pray, is to stand, is to preach against the wickedness, is to stand against it in opposition to it. That way, when God comes, we need to ask ourselves, is he going to find us working in his fields? Is he going to find us laboring in his business? Is he going to find us toiling amongst his people, leading his sheep, doing works of righteousness? Or is he going to find us as so many treading in the dung hills? So many that refuse to take a stand. So many that refuse to make a position. But some as includes lesbians too, right? Yes, sir. Okay. The city of Sodom was such that if you read in Genesis chapter 19, men and young boys, and, the, and we see there was children, right? So that there was also women involved. They go both ways. They interact both ways. Now I will, I will, I will say that in my experience, I generally find the lesbian to be more approachable. In other words, what goes on in our day and in our time is that there's a lot of confusion. There's this like, oh, I kissed a girl junk, right? Yeah. And so young teenage girls do stupid things, yeah. and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're reprobate. They've done something dumb, it's that's wicked, right. it's disgusting, and they can be redeemed. And that's why a scripture like this, when it says that they may be put to shame, yeah. and when they're put to shame, they would seek his name. Uh, I've, I've seen it where people that have done stuff like that have saw the end of it and been like, ugh. They got married, they lived a normal life, and, and, and moved on. It was just a stupid thing that they did. That being said, that is prevalent with, with girls. The Bible records girls as the weaker vessel. It says, that, it says that they are in a position where they should be led of their father until such a time when they are passed on to their husband, and they are to be in under his dominion, his guidance, and his authority. So today, we don't have fathers being fathers. We don't have women then being passed on to their husbands. So there's this time when they just do really dumb things, okay? <clears throat> Generally, lesbianism is one of those. Now, when they cross over the line to where they're burning in their lust one toward another, they're done. That's it, right? That's, that's the tell, when it's, when it's a, a burning, lustful desire. But with men, it, it's, it's just not... It's not just some dumb thing. It's just not some stupid thing. It's just not. It, it's it. It takes it takes a special kind of turning over by God, an unnatural affection, something that's completely just. Like, it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. So I have I have never seen the I did something stupid and then changed. I have seen I I was taken advantage of people that 
very young and something happened to them and it messed them up and made them really confused, live a normal life later on. I've seen that, right? Because that's without someone's control. But someone that engages in that, I think it's a completely different thing. Being, being attacked versus willingly going about and doing those things. So that's kind of the things that are different between women and men. men are, women, again, can do kind of foolish and stupid things and, and they kind of disassociate that. Whereas, whereas men, if they were to do that same thing, it's, it's unnatural. It's, it's, it's wrong. <clears throat> so then that, that's where something like this portion of scripture actually really helps me because I'm seeing the, the whole thing play out. We're seeing us calling out to God, asking God in humbleness that he would make his voice because, because I can't cry loud enough that I'm going to make a change, but I'm at least going to say something. At least I'm going to preach it, put it on YouTube. I'm going to try to be a voice the best I can. I'm going to preach it and teach it to you guys. I'm going to preach it and teach it to people I come across. Yeah. It's disgusting. It's unnatural. It's not right. I'm training my children in the same way. I'm tra- my wife is learning, this, they're learning the same things. We grew in these same things together. But the world here is assembled in contradiction to that. And what you have is Lot's children, who, like I said, are two types of people. They're either full-blown sodomites themselves, and you can read that in Genesis 19, or they're the ones that stay with Lot and live Christian-like, but are so messed up that they didn't understand that it wasn't the end of the world, and they weren't the last three human beings living. They were were not Christian in the sense that they had any comprehension. They were just worldly, whatever, believers. But either way, the end of those that are of the world and the end of those that would yoke themselves up with them is that they will become as dung for the earth. They will essentially be destroyed, be spread about, they shall be no more. The Bible records that, that Christians will one day bathe our feet in the blood of those that are judged. Right? It's a very gruesome reality, but it's going to be something that um, I don't know if I'm necessarily looking forward to it, but it's just, it's just a telling of the great multitudes that will be judged and us who will stand there. Uh, free and saved. But for now, we need to fight against this mentality of verse 12 where they say, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. Because that's ultimately the goal. If they can possess the house of God, how? By getting into it. If they can possess the house of God, how? By, by, by controlling it, overlording it, by making it so afraid to do what the house of God is for. And that's to be the pillar and ground of the truth. Then they've taken control. Let's take to ourselves the house of God. That way we are rendering it um, useless in, in the area that it's supposed to be. The prayer then, oh my God, make them as a wheel of stubble before the wind. Verse 14, as the fire that burneth the wood is a flame. It says, again, crying out to God and saying, God, fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name, O Lord, that somebody that was in it would see the judgment falling on the filthy reprobates and would be pulled out for it. Or somebody that is sitting on the fence would see the judgment that's going on and would finally decide to get on the Lord's side. Would to God they would. Let them be confounded, let them be troubled, let them be put to shame, let them perish. Why to the end, and this should always be our prayer and our, our desire. We don't desire, my, my immediate desire isn't just like, I just, want, I just want the pride prayed to be destroyed. That's not like the most important thing. The most important thing in my mind and in my understanding is verse 18. That men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art most high over all the earth. Okay, so whatever God has to do so that men finally get it that Jehovah God is above all, that Jehovah God is most high, that he is above all the earth, that he be lifted up, that he be glorified, that he be uh, exalted in the names, of, in, in the voices of all mankind, whatever he needs to do is the end. And one of those things that I'm seeing here from the pages of the scriptures is that he would judge the wicked and would render unto them their due recompense and in the end setting them down would lift himself up and he would be seen appropriately as the most high. That's ultimately my desire. People always accuse us of just being so hateful towards the Sodomites. You're just hate, hate, hate. Do you know why I hate them so much? Because the Bible records, do not I hate them, O Lord. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Why? Because I hate them that hate thee. Because I love God, I hate the Sodomites. Because I love God, I hate the child molesters. They're the same thing. Because I hate, because I love God, I hate those that hate God. We can just put this into our own perspective. If, if somebody hated my wife, and I was just like going out and playing football with them, and budding around with them, and I was just friends with them, and just, you know, you're my bro, and we're just friends, that's not being loving towards my wife, right? This guy hates my wife, and I'm going to be best friends with him? No, no. It 
right? If I love my wife, I appropriately hate those that hate her. In the same way, if I love my God, I appropriately hate those that love God. And those that hate love God, or those that hate God, are those that have been turned over to a reprobate mind. The Bible says God gave them up. God gave them over. God gave them up to do those things. So it's not because they have done the deeds that they're reprobate. It's they do those deeds because they are reprobate. That makes sense, right? It's not like they do that act and they're reprobate. They only do those things because they're reprobate. Why? Because they've rejected God time and time and time. They didn't even want to retain God in their knowledge. And God says, fine, and turns them over to a reprobate mind. Three times it says, you can look at passages like, uh, like Pharaoh, right? Joseph kept coming to Pharaoh, kept coming to Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then finally it turns and says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There's a point of no return. There's always that extension of grace. People have been abused. People have been hurt. People do stupid things. I'm gracious with all of those things. I don't think that anyone who's ever done an act is automatically reprobate. But it's a good tell, an indication of where their heart's at. So yes, we will throw out the lifeline. Yes, we will pray God that, that God judges the wicked in order that, in order that they would see, be put to shame, and, and would come to God, would believe on God, and, and stop doing that garbage, right? Right? But th that's ultimately the, the heart of the whole matter is that we seek that God would be glorified. And because we love him, we've got to hate what he hates. It's, it's, just, it's just the commission. It's just the understanding. I'm not going to love on somebody that hates my father. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. All right, thank you, Father, for this day and for giving us this scripture to, uh, to help us through a little bit of an understanding of, of, of how our ministry on this earth is to be. Uh, we're supposed to seek that you would be glorified first. And uh, unfortunately, the, the case of the world is such that in order to, for you to get the utmost of glory, people need to be judged and put down. I, I, I say it's unfortunate because um, my mind is finite, and I don't, under, I don't understand why people need to be brought to the point of, of judgment before another person might see and fear. I, I, I don't know. It's just it's something that's perhaps hard for me to understand, but I just got to believe it. I mean, the scriptures are clear that I'm to be praying in opposition to the wickedness of folks that hate you. And, and, and praying that they would be judged. And praying that your scriptures would render unto them due recompense. And praying even that, Lord, if, 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 uh, if it were possible, an appropriate leader would step up and would enforce biblical law properly. And put to death those that commit such things. And it's not just sodomy. It's, it's adultery being a rebellious child. It's kidnapping. All of those laws, I believe, should render unto somebody death if they commit them. And I, I just uh, trust you, God, in that, and I, I pray that you give me the heart to understand your perspective on these kinds of things. When somebody, um, when you love people so much, but have them have them turn to you and say, I, I don't even want to retain you in my, my memory. When you create something and it says, I, I don't believe in you, I don't love you, I hate you, you don't exist to me. I can see how that would be so hurtful and uh, help me to understand those things and to react accordingly in this uh, crazy, confusing, and mixed up world that you've called us to call in. Christ, let me pray. Amen. 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 Alright, Brother Rob.